A little further down the river is where a couple of footbridges were thrown across as the Marines attempted to gain access to the West Bank. The bridges are long gone now, but a single cable remains. Today, it serves an excellent purpose. The men of the small village on the other side have put together little log rafts and applying a bit of hand over hand power have accomplished a perfect transportation system. A further downstream, the river flattens out and here the tides of battle swung back and forth for many weeks. Violent, desperate fighting continued. The Japanese were determined to hold the West Bank and the Marines were just as determined to reach the other side. The conflict seesawed back and forth and often developed into hand-to-hand -hand bayonet warfare. In early October of 42, the Marines staged a daring assault across the Matanaka. Crossing the river upstream, they moved westward and then in three separate forces moved northward toward Point Cruz. The westernmost group was the 1st Battalion, 7th Marines, under command of Lieutenant Colonel Lewis Chesty Puller. The country west of the Matanacau is a series of harsh ridges divided by deep, heavily wooded ravines. Now, as they moved through the rugged terrain, they discovered a large group of the enemy in the bottom of a large ravine to their left. It was the Japanese 4th Infantry, and the Marines had them trapped. Now, this is the spot where Puller's group was located, as it looks today. Colonel Puller sized up the situation and immediately called in all available artillery and mortar fire. As the heavy barrage poured into the ravine, the trapped 4th Infantry panicked and tried to climb up the steep sidewalls. Exposed, they became targets of murderous automatic weapons fired from the Marines along the top of the ridge. Dropping back to the bottom, they again became victims of the renewed artillery barrage. And so it went until the Marines literally used up all of their mortar ammunition. This is how the bottom of the ravine looks today. Fashionable new homes have been built nearby. There are virtually no signs or reminders of the fact that most of the Japanese 4th Infantry was wiped out here on that October afternoon of 1942. It was later learned the Marine victory that day had totally upset the enemy's plans for a major attack on the United States forces scheduled for the next day. But near the mouth of the Matanaka today, there are many reminders of the fury of those more violent times. While the Cactus Air Force was running a magnificent batting average against the hordes of Japanese planes that were attacking Henderson daily, some of the Cactus aircraft went into the loss column. According to villagers, this one crash landed shortly after takeoff. Another plane nearby reveals a somber clue as to how and why it came to grief. The villagers have assembled a collection of the tools of war that they have found on the nearby battlefields. Once the fury had subsided, there are rusting cannons now mute and ignored, but which once belched death indiscriminately. Old and broken machine guns rust away, their deadly muzzles silenced for good. And explosive shells abandoned before the destructive power could be unleashed. And here's a sight some of the boys will remember. Colonel Fox's foxhole, designed to stand off anything but a direct hit. The men who fought so hard and so long on the banks of the Matanaka River 
would never believe what's happened to the area since they've left. It has now become a prosperous retailing center. Stores run by Chinese merchants dominate the scene. And it's the hub of the sizable Chinese community that now prospers on Guadalcanal. But the battles were taking their toll. There were many wounded, and by October 15th, the most vicious enemy of all was attacking both sides with devastating results. Malaria was hitting hard, and more than 100 Marines a day were falling victim to the insidious disease. The Marines were tired. They had been on Guadalcanal for more than two months, and during the heat, the humidity, short rations, constant battle with the enemy, and now malaria. But there was also the long-awaited word that they were going to get relief. The United States Army America Division, 164th Infantry, were arriving and would share in the remaining task of driving the Japanese from Guadalcanal. But the Japanese were also being reinforced, and there were probably 30,000 of them on the island now. Their only goal was to stop the operation at Henderson Field. The Cactus Air Force was growing fast, and it was exacting a heavy toll on the Japanese effort. Day and night, the field was subjected to heavy air attack from waves of bombers. There was always a nightly visit from Washing Machine Charlie, which was guaranteed to keep everyone awake. The bomber flights were severely chopped up by the Cactus planes, but inevitably, some got through, and the damage to the field and to its planes was enormous. Then there was Pistol Pete to be reckoned with. Pistol Pete was a Japanese 150 millimeter gun, which sat up on Mount Austin. Overlooking Henderson, it would spasmodically fire heavy rounds into the field, which did their share of the damage. But great as the damage was, the Air Force still grew, and Henderson was improved with the installation of steel runway matting, which solved much of the mud problems caused by heavy rain. And that steel matting still plays a major part on Guadalcanal today. As soon as the war was over, the local people put it to good use. It was great for landing strips, but it was even better for corral and fence building. Strong and durable, even attractive, it will still be in good use long after all other reminders of the war have passed into dust. Edison Field today is a modern jet air terminal. Its runway is 8,000 feet long, and the traffic load is light. There is no problem of congestion. On the north side of the runway, is a structure that will bring back memories to all those who were on Guadalcanal during the war. The old control tower has long since been abandoned, but it still stands to this day, probably because no one wants to bother tearing it down. Seeing it now, one can imagine the dramatic events of that other time, when it was the center for the operations of the Cactus Air Force. And in the jungle nearby are the remains of one of the hundreds of Zero fighters that fell under the guns of Cactus Air Force fighters, or from the deadly fire of the anti-aircraft batteries that defended Henderson Field. There were more than 900 Japanese fighter planes lost in the Battle of Guadalcanal, plus nearly a thousand bombers, float planes, and flying boats. They were to be sorely missed in the struggle soon to come. By October 24th, an additional strip was in operation at Henderson and the Japanese made a determined bid to take it. It centered near Bloody Ridge. The Marines, side by side with the newly arrived 164th Infantry, were hit hard by a tremendous assault. The attack was just as fanatical as earlier ones had been, and the results were the same. Horrendous losses for Hirohito, and a magnificent victory for the GIs and the Leathernecks. Today, the area where that battle raged is a lovely pastoral setting. The grass is deep and rich, and overhead are flights of gaily colored parrots as they soar into the nearby jungles, chattering raucously as they pass. But there are the remains of violence here, too. Almost as if in formation are the hulks of armored vehicles, which came to a sudden end in this picturesque field three decades ago. They are forgotten now. They have simply become a part of the landscape, unnoticed by the very few who happen to pass this way. Simultaneously, the Japanese attacked near the Matanakar, a few miles to the west. The stubborn Colonel Oka tried again, and his efforts were just as futile. In two nights of fighting, much of it hand-to-hand, -hand, the Japanese were soundly beaten. 
Three times they had tried to take Henderson, and three times they were denied. In the last two nights of fighting, they lost over 3,500 dead, and the American flag still flew over Henderson. Two young friends of mine explore the battlefield today. The jungle is much as it was then, and in it are hidden rusting reminders of the fury. To these young men, the war is simply something that happened in a world before their time. A legend their elders talk about occasionally. But something about the ground they walk on gives the boys a sense of awe and the uncomfortable knowledge that many men fought and died where they are now standing. But as with kids anywhere, a sense of awe doesn't last very long. Now as a sorely damaged enemy paused to lick his wounds, the Marines and the Army began making life a little more comfortable for themselves. Across the slot on the island of Melita, there was another man who was saving lives. He is Bishop Daniel Stivenberg, and I met him on Guadalcanal. Uh, Bishop Dan, back in those days, in the beginning of the Battle of Guadalcanal, were, I understand that you were a, a coast watcher, is that true? I was not an official coast washer, let's call an unofficial one. Yeah. But I was provided by the Americans with the Taylor radio set. I see. So, so that I could find out or better tell them what was doing, ask them what I had to do. And they said when the Americans were found out in the open sea swimming around, then I had to pick them up if they were Japanese to push them down. I see. Did you many times relay actual information, say, on ship well, and everything else? sometimes it's about three or four times, especially about the submarine. Yeah. It was always recharging the batteries at night time. Oh, and we heard that regularly. And therefore, I reported those, you see. And after that, I never heard the submarine anymore, so it must have happened somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Bishop Dan, that bay out there, Iron Bottom Bay, and uh, a lot of ships have gone down oh, yeah. to the bottom. Uh, did you ever uh, report any of these ships yourself as a coast watcher? Did oh, yeah, I never was in that area. You see, I was on the island of Malaita. I see. And the island of Malaita is from Honiara. It's about 60 or 70 miles away, mm -hmm. uh, straight across. Mm -hmm. And in that area, what we got mostly was the fellows who couldn't get back to base or something like this. Their planes got shot up and uh, they got in difficulties. Yeah. And I remember very well. One of the men came over around about 6, 6.30 in the evening in a plane. We saw him coming over and said, oh, here in the tropics, it goes dark fairly quick after that. And we saw there was something wrong with his wings. Yeah. Uh, the main little bling, you see, so he must have been shot up, he thought. And anyway, he passed over our place, and then uh, he came back again. Mm -hmm. So by that time, we thought that he was a Japanese. Yeah. Later on, we heard he on top in the plane thought that we were Japanese. We put the lights out, you see. <laughs> so he came back over our place, and then suddenly, there was an island in front of the place where I was, suddenly we heard Poof, that something happened to the plane and dropped in the sea. So we went out with a lot of boys, canoes, dinghies, call it what you like, and we went out to the back of the island in the open sea to see if he could help the man. It was okay. one of these pitch dark nights, you see, and you couldn't see three or four feet ahead. And we were out there, I was with a boy out in a canoe, and we had been looking for about 10 minutes, quarter of an hour, 20 minutes. And then I said to the boy in English, I said, listen, it's no good anymore, huh? he's had it. Uh -huh. And we were certain that the man had had it. Yeah. But just to show you how dark it was, he was about six, seven feet away from the canoe. He heard me speaking English, and he said to me, he said, I am an American. Yeah. Can you come and pick me up, you see? So we picked him up then, caught him into the dinghy on the, in the canoe, and paddled him home to the station again, you see. So just through that chance <laughs> phrase in English, a few words. He probably would yeah. have been swimming till today, I if he would have been well to swim him long enough, you see. But uh, all that, you see, that happened, it happened only in about 20 minutes' time, if you like. Mm -hmm. The going and the coming and all those sort of things. Yeah. And then we took him home, 
and he stayed uh, in the place where, where I was. And the only thing we had to smoke in those days, you have seen it probably in the Solomon Islands, the black stick tobacco. Yes, indeed. And yes. the only paper we had was toilet paper. <laughs> and that's all I could give him to smoke, you see. Yeah. And you know who those man, this man was I uh, picked out of the sea that who, who was it? Joe Foss. Joe Foss? Yeah, he was they, one of the famous marine pilots, you see. He was an ace. Yeah, he was he an was ace. He was a war ace, and he eventually went into politics in America. That's right. Uh, he got the Congressional Medal of Honor. Congressional Medal of Honor. And then uh, he got into politics afterwards and became the governor of South Dakota. South Dakota. Yeah. I went to see him afterwards when I was back in America. Yeah. And stayed with him for a day or two. And we're still corresponding. But uh, he's not too well these days, I hear. Yeah. That's the only thing. Uh, what a remarkable thing, though. Yeah. Just for one chance phrase. Yeah. In the yeah. pitch blackness of yeah. night. Just a few words, really. Isn't and it? a life is saved. Yeah. A life is saved. Would you Would you say if you had not uh, stopped and picked him up that he would? Ah, have yes, I wouldn't have a chance. He would. wouldn't have had a chance. Why Why is that? Is it sharks, you mean? There are sharks in the first place. Yeah. But the second place, it was so far away from the shore. Oh, I see. And uh, pitch dark night, yeah. so he would have had the whole night to swim there. Yeah. You couldn't see the land even. Yeah. We knew the land because things were there. You see. But uh, he certainly wouldn't have had the chance to leave him. Yep. Well, I'm sure that uh, that he must have many fond thoughts of you. I have him too. He goes very friendly. <laughs> Afterwards, you see, he came over with his whole squadron. Yeah. And uh, we didn't know they were about ten or eleven planes. Yeah. And they flew over very high, and then suddenly they all came down very, very low, and each plane of the squadron had a bag of something. You see. In, inside, you know, these Hessian bags. One a bag of chocolate, another bag of salt, the third one a bag of cigarettes, and all the things. It's just as a compensation. And they dropped them off to you? They dropped them off the plane. Yeah. yeah. Bishop, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I hope that when you come to America, you come and see me next time. Right, we are. <laughs> I keep that in mind. Thank you, Bishop. Thanks, Alice. Right. Thank now the battle moved westward toward Point Cruz. There was to be heavy fighting ahead because now the roles were reversed. The enemy was in dug-in fortifications, and the Americans were attacking. The Japanese were masters of camouflage, and careful, cautious approach was necessary. The Allied forces were to be tied up near Point Cruz for more than two months. In fact, from November 19, 1942, till January 10th of 43, the line was in the middle of what is now the capital city of Haniara. The men who fought the Battle of Guadalcanal will not believe what has happened in the area around Point Cruz. From out of the war-shattered jungle and coconut groves, a big city has come into being. There's still a village or two on the outskirts of town, and they're much as they were then. But nothing else is the same. After the war, the British Solomon Island government established Haniara as the new capital, instead of rebuilding it to Lagi. Thus, it's an all-new city. They have provided all the conveniences of modern-day living, and that even includes two traffic signals on the main street and even the occasional traffic jam. There are stores galore selling every conceivable type of merchandise. There's a motion picture theater, many government offices. Haniara is the trading and communications center for all of the Solomon Islands. There are many buses which deliver the populace of outlying villages to the city center. There aren't many car owners in Guadalcanal and the bus service is important. One of the loveliest things about Haniara are the flame or Christmas trees that line the city streets. There are several hotels. The newest and largest is the Mendana, where I stayed. And there are some private clubs, the Yacht Club on the Beach and the fashionable Guadalcanal Club. There are a lot of fine soccer players in Haniara, and this field is a busy one. There are churches, too, many of them, and they serve a very devout group of people. And there are excellent schools provided by the government and by the churches. The British government is making every effort to offer the highest form of education to the local people. Many outstanding students are developing, and soon they will become qualified leaders. By the end of 42, the Cactus Air Force had expanded into still another airstrip. The new one was closer to Lunga Point, and it was identified as Fighter 2. 
It was soon to play a part in one of the war's most intriguing operations. The Japanese secret code had been broken, and Allied intelligence knew that Admiral Yamamoto, commander-in-chief of the Japanese Navy, was going to arrive at Kamili Airport on Bougainville at 9.45, April 18th. Yamamoto was regarded as Japan's top military expert. If his plane could be shot down, it would probably shorten the war. At Fighter II, there were 18 new Lockheed Lightning P-38s. They were given the order, get Yamamoto. They were the fastest planes in the Pacific, and on the morning of April 18th, they took off on their mission. Two had trouble, and one of these plunged into the sea off Lunga Point. Its pilot was okay, and the P-38 sank to the bottom where it rests today, three decades later. Wally Gibbons located the wreck, and Dr. Walter Stark dove for a closer look. It's in remarkably good shape for all its years beneath the sea. Salvages have stripped off its machine guns, and the twin boom tail has broken off. Everything else remains much as it was, except that it's now the home of thousands of beautiful little fish. The rest of the planes on the mission flew on to Bougainville. It was a tricky operation and depended on split-second timing, sort of like threading a needle 400 miles away. Admiral Yamamoto was a brilliant man. Educated at Yale University in America, he had been regarded as a friend of the United States until the war broke out, when he immediately pledged and fulfilled his total and absolute devotion to his Emperor Hirohito. His sheer brilliance was credited for much of the success the Japanese Navy had enjoyed in the early part of the war. Among his many outstanding characteristics was his absolute obsession for punctuality. He demanded that his every activity be carried out on a precise schedule, right to the second, or else. Allied intelligence was aware of Yamamoto's phobia, and it was built into the intricate needle-threading navigational calculations that were engineered on Guadalcanal. Of course, there were other navigational factors involved, such things as wind force and direction that would influence the ground speed of the P-38s, and that would be experienced by Yamamoto's two bombers and his escort of six Zeros. And speaking of Zeros, it was also known that there were 100 of them based at Yamamoto's destination, Kamili Airfield. It was a statistic that had caused some concern to the P-38 pilots as they roared on toward the meeting place. The P-38s, led by Colonel Thomas Lampier, spotted Bougainville, and quick calculations indicated they were right on schedule. But where was Yamamoto? And then suddenly, the Admiral's flight was spotted, exactly where it was supposed to be. Yamamoto was keeping his date with destiny, as he lived his life on schedule. The attack was quick and sure, both bombers, carrying the Admiral's entire staff, went down. Yamamoto's fell under the hail of fire from Colonel Lanfear's guns. Two of the P-38s were lost, and the rest made their way back to Fighter II. Mission accomplished. Ironically, a short time later, Colonel Lanfear's brother was shot down and crashed in almost the exact spot as did Yamamoto's plane. Strange fortunes of war. The city of Haniara, rapidly expanding eastward, is about to take over. Like so many airports, it may become the victim of real estate development. But at least part will remain, for it has already become the Honiara Golf Course, complete with sand greens. While the GIs and the Leathernecks battered away at the enemy's dug-in fortifications, the U.S. Navy was achieving a major success near Tassafaranga. The American Navy had been gathering its strength and on November 13th and 14th, lashed into the Japanese forces in two historic engagements called the First and Second Battles of Guadalcanal. The enemy was attempting to deliver troop reinforcements and supplies. In desperation, Admiral Tanaka ordered the transports to run on the beach. Dr. Walter Stark visits the scene of the subsequent devastation. It wasn't difficult for Wally Gibbons to locate the evidence of that fateful morning of November 15, 1942, only yards off the Carl Beaches, part of the shattered hulk of the transport Yamatsuki protruded pathetically above the water. We were quickly into our diving gear, and Janice led the way in our inspection of the derelict hulk of the 4,000-ton vessel. Fighter planes of the Cactus Air Force from Henderson Field had found the Japanese transports within moments after they had been beached and for virtually the entire day, they bombed and strafed the stricken vessels. Later, they were joined by dive bombers and torpedo bombers. Marine artillery also blasted the trapped transports. 
and finally the destroyer Meade zeroed in with her five-inch guns. Janice discovered one of the many big artillery pieces the Japanese had brought along. This one is a three-inch gun, and it remains still chained to the deck. Horrible as the death of the Yamatsuki must have been, her battered carcass again illustrates the reborning powers of the sea. After three decades, the great steel hull, once ripped by the fury of the enemy and made white hot by the fires that followed, has become the home of thousands of sea creatures and a garden spot of delicate beauty. The thunderous explosions delivered from air, sea, and land literally broke the Yamatsuki into pieces. In her final moments, part of her rolled over and came to rest bottom up. The hull was apparently separated into at least two sections completely apart from each other. Obviously, much of the cargo in her hold spilled out into the sea and washed away at the whim of the tides that engulfed her. We moved only a few hundred yards away to another victim of the Battle of Guadalcanal, the transport Kinagawa Maru. Like the Yamatsuki, she has become a veritable garden of magnificent marine growth, and the tragic end of these ships has provided us with an unusual opportunity of measuring growth rates of all types of reef life. It's simply a matter of counting the years since November 15, 1942. Admiral Tanaka, realizing escape was impossible, ordered these transports to be beached in the hope that the troops they carried could get ashore to reinforce their beleaguered comrades and that at least some of the desperately needed cargo could be landed. It's true that some of the troops did get ashore, perhaps as many as 2,000, but the cargo and the supplies were doomed. It was a disastrous battle for Japan. Many thousands of her soldiers and sailors, thousands of tons of supplies, all of the equipment and artillery of a division, and 11 large transports had gone to the bottom. Her Navy had taken a whipping as well. Two large battleships, a cruiser, and three destroyers were sunk, and many more damaged. In the air, several hundred planes and their pilots were lost. It was an important victory for the U.S. Navy, and one which had telling results. Tanaka's dreaded Tokyo Express was just about derailed for good. There would be no more major opposition from the Japanese Navy, nor would there be any further question as to the American control of the air and the seas at Guadalcanal. Certainly, Japanese ships would no longer steam into Iron Bottom Sound and lob shells into Henderson Field. From ashore, I discovered still another of Tanaka's ill-fated transports that were beached that dawn of November 15th, less than one half a mile from the others. This one had run further into the beach. The battering she took from the air, from ground artillery and from naval guns was tremendous. It's hard to believe that anyone could have lived through it. And I guess that very few did. She's rusting away now and battered by the sea. And one day will yield to those inexorable forces and disappear forever. In early December, the American forces were put under the command of the U.S. Army. General Alexander Patch took over from Marine General Vandegrift. In early January, the two-month stalemate ended, and the combined forces moved westward in a drive that was to bring the campaign to an end. It was to be a rugged, hard-fought drive. Armored units were brought in to flush the enemy from its fortified positions.
I found one Sherman tank that was lost to Japanese anti-tank fire. This is the only American tank on Guadalcanal today. Her name is Jezebel, probably tacked on her by an exuberant young tank commander who would never have imagined that she would one day be found deserted and terribly alone on the remote edge of a copra plantation. The mortal wound she suffered is very obvious, a direct hit from an armor-piercing shell, and Jezebel had bought the farm. The identity and fate of her crew is not known, but it's probable that they, too, died along with Jezebel that fateful day in January of 43. Then the sunlight dimmed, and I felt a warm drop of water in my forehead, then another, and then the deluge began. I was caught in one of those tropical rainstorms that played a major role in the miseries of Guadalcanal. The rain in the tropics is an everyday thing, and the Marines and the Army soon learned that no matter what you tried to do, you would wind up every day wringing wet and covered with gooey, sticky mud. My friend Ken Ward of Haniara, who is a true authority on the history of Guadalcanal, suggested that I stop at a tiny village near Cape Esperance and arrange to see some heavy Japanese artillery on village land. The very old and very tiny village chief met me and would be pleased to show me the guns. But there was a small problem, one dollar for admission. Our conversation was difficult Sign language is better than words. I paid the money and the deal was done. The old chief personally escorted me and we started off. The little village is home to about 30 people. 100 or so chickens, a dozen fat pigs, and about two dozen dogs. The chief didn't tell me that it was a half mile steep uphill climb to the location. In the very hot midday sun, it was a considerable journey. But it was worth it. For here on the hillside overlooking Iron Bottom Sound and Savo Island were the remains of four heavy Japanese artillery pieces. They are located in a broad grassy meadow and spread out about 100 yards apart for a quarter of a mile. They look out over the seas on which dozens of tremendous naval battles were fought. Perhaps they fired some shells into those frays. They certainly command the strait between Guadalcanal and Savo Island. Surely they watched as the many desperate actions took place out there. But strangely enough, no one apparently knows just what these guns did throughout the conflict. As a matter of fact, it was not until the American forces occupied this area just before the campaign ended that we even knew the guns were here. One thing is obvious. Someone pulled and tugged very hard to get them up on this hillside. Perhaps the extraordinary view made the effort worthwhile. But now they sit here, quietly and silently. Oddly enough, the exposure to the elements for more than 30 years has not caused a great deal of damage. And at least they serve one good purpose today. The very rare occasional visitor, like me, pays one dollar to the village coppers. It's not another Disneyland, but it is money, and it all helps.
In January, another event took place at the far western end of the island that was remarkable. My friend Walter Stark visited the scene. Wars have a way of creating deeds beyond the imagination. The story of the death of one of Japan's super submarines, the I-1, is a notable example. In the last desperate days of the Japanese experience on Guadalcanal, the I-1 was pressed into humble service as a transport. The ceaseless vigilance of the Cactus Air Force and the growing superiority of the U.S. Navy had ended the days of the Tokyo Express. The 10 or 12,000 Japanese troops that were desperately fighting a losing action were in a pitiful condition of short supply. They were on starvation rations with little ammunition left. The I-1, with 70 or 80 tons of supplies in her hold and on deck, crept in close to the beach near Kamimbo Bay, west of Cape Esperance, on the night of 29 January 1943. Here, the great fighting ship reached her destiny. As she lay on the surface in shallow water, a Royal New Zealand Navy corvette, the Kiwi, suddenly appeared on the scene. The Kiwi spotted the I-1, and her captain instantly reacted to the situation with a remarkably brave decision. He was determined that his small ship would sink the great Japanese submarine. He ordered his gunners to set up a hail of machine gun fire to keep the Japanese crew from reaching their large deck gun, which of course could have blown the Kiwi out of the water with one hit. With the same kind of courage that David must have had in his battle with Goliath, the captain of the Kiwi ordered full speed ahead and rammed his little vessel into the I-1 amidships. Then, just to make sure the giant was down, he backed off and twice again drove his ship into the stricken sub. At this point, with her bow heavily damaged and guns too hot to operate, the Kiwi turned over the job to her sister ship, the Moa, which until then had been unable to assist owing to Kiwi's close and repeated clinches. The Moa continued the hail of fire until shortly thereafter the battle ended when the mortally wounded I-1 ran onto the outer edge of the reef. Subsequently, important secret documents that aided the Allied cause were recovered from the wreck. The New Zealand Navy is well proud of this outstanding deed. Since her death on the reef at Kamimbo, the I-1 has lain with her nose in the shallows and her stern still pointing to seaward at a depth of 90 feet down the outer reef slope. In addition to the forces of currents and waves, she has also been torn apart by the efforts of salvagers who have recovered many tons of valuable metals from her structure. Much of the damage now visible is the result of explosive charges placed in the hull by these salvage workers. This shattered hulk is all that remains of a once proud naval ship. She was created and built for the sole purpose of war and destruction, and she was destroyed by war. Now she rests on the distant shores of a foreign land, virtually forgotten. In silence, she slowly returns to the elements. Slowly, the American forces edged westward in the final hours of the campaign. They were hoping to trap and capture the 10 or 12,000 of the enemy remaining on the island. But it was not to be. On the morning of February 9th, 1943, our troops converged on this spot and found the enemy was gone. Somehow, during the preceding night or two, the Japanese Navy had carried out still another unbelievable feat of military seamanship. Under cover of darkness, the entire remaining force of Japanese soldiers, estimated at more than 10,000 men, were taken from this beach and placed aboard Navy ships. They sailed off to fight again another day. But there were many more of the Japanese who would never leave Guadalcanal. In 1971, a delegation from Japan erected this memorial shrine to the memory of all who died in the conflict. The ratio was very unequal. Approximately 28,000 Japanese were killed here, as compared to 1,600 Army and Marine personnel. These are Japanese prayer sticks offered to the memory of individual soldiers. Scattered about are pitiful remembrances tools of war,
a Japanese howitzer. An aircraft propeller and a small outboard motor. The Battle of Guadalcanal was over. Well, that's the way it was. August 7th, 1942, February 9th, 1943, the Battle of Guadalcanal in the Solomon Islands. Now, the great Allied victory involved the dedicated efforts of many men and women from many countries, all fighting for a common cause. And the Japanese army and navies, even a defeat, illustrated fantastic courage that never wavered here or in any of the subsequent battles of the Pacific War. They earned the respect of all of those who had to face them. Now, on the Allied side, credit must be given to many native people of Guadalcanal, Solomon Island scouts, whose knowledge and bravery contributed so much toward the ultimate victory. And we cannot praise too highly the district officers who, in the face of the Japanese invasion and occupation, maintained the British government position and their control over their subjects. And because of their example, not one of their subjects wavered in their devotion to the king, which is a tribute to the government and to the loyalty of these native peoples. Credit must be given to the Coast Watchers, who scattered throughout the Solomon performed a tremendous service in providing the only communications and warning system in the early stages of the struggle. Incredible dedication at great personal risk that saved thousands of lives. And the armies and navies of both uh, Australia and New Zealand they performed in a superhuman manner. Many examples of bravery above and beyond the call of duty. And the valiant efforts of the United States Army, who took over the difficult final stages at the Battle of Guadalcanal and drove the enemy from its shores. The officers and the men of the ships of the American Navy were a vital part in this war from the very beginning to the end. Their glorious efforts against great odds certainly made the victory possible, and their many heroic deeds will not be forgotten. And honor should be paid to the Cactus Air Force, that valiant group of flyers assembled at Henderson Field. The men and aircraft from the United States Army Air Corps, the New Zealand Air Force, and the Navy and Marine flyers, who first defended the island of Guadalcanal. And then they reached out to help destroy the enemy throughout the Solomon. Now, notwithstanding the heroism of all other groups involved, no one can deny that the game ball of Guadalcanal belonged to the United States Marines. They were given the opportunity and the challenge of being the first American unit to meet the enemy on an eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball basis. It was a great test. Men, materials, and courage. And the results are gloriously recorded in the annals of human conflict. Not only did the Marines win the Battle of Guadalcanal, but they also stopped the Japanese dead in their tracks. They set the stage for a series of smashing victories that forced the enemy's constant retreat and the final total surrender. As they have throughout their 200 years of history, the United States Marines fought in glory and in the true meaning of their motto, Semper Fidelis, always faithful.